Hi, it's Titus Murray here from Southern Highland Structural Geology. I'm out for my run, um, having a look at some ironbark trees. These trees are amazing. They are one of the few eucalypts that don't lose their bark. Instead, it sort of forms a fireproof covering. Um, you can see how this furry bark here means that they're fireproof. They will burn, but then they'll often sprout at the base and um, become coppiced. And you'll see this is actually one tree that effectively has two trunks going up to the top there. Anyway, we're going to have a look at the uh, analysis we did of the ironbark prospect before it was drilled based on the public data that was put out by Q. Have a right. look at some work that we did in August 2020. Um, at that stage, the ironbark uh, prospect was being sputtered. And so what this is, is work we did back in August um, as a prediction and we tucked away to see what would happen after the well was, was drilled. Um, and so this is obviously post the well, so we know what's happened. You know, the well's called iron bark. And so I added in a few photos and things from my mate, Nick Bray. And Nicholas has a, uh, is a landscape architect and chainsaw sculptor, and he specializes in iron bark playgrounds, thus the the logo's ironbark playgrounds and that this is what ironbark wood looks like this is him setting up a, a fence and a new playground um, so you get an idea hopefully of what the tree looks like and how we dealt with the prospect so the ironbark is a bit as i said out in the in the bush um, in the introduction is an unusual tree in that it doesn't lose its bark you can see in this picture up here this is north of sydney these are normal eucalypts in here which have got a white white um, trunks this is them losing the bark and they, those of you that live in uh, in uh, California and places like that where eucalypts have been planted that's the eucalypt you'll think of whereas the iron bark is this central black thing in here and it's um, they're unusual in that they they keep growing their their bark and the bark accumulates and accumulates a bit like a cork tree but the whole idea about this is it makes them fire retardant and this is um, uh, from the fires from this time last year. The Ironbark Prospect um, was uh, approved uh, mid-2020 and so you can see in here there's a whole cluster of developments in here uh, and it's the, in this sort of acreage just a little bit further uh, outboard uh, of the main development areas. And it, there are actually a set of wells around it. It wasn't a complete wildcat. So this is the the work that we're going to base it on. It, um, it is the map, and you can see here's the ironbark prospect as it was proposed. And it's important to recognise that we didn't do this for anyone. This was a demonstration project. We did this as a way of testing our software fault risk and seeing how it would perform. And it's all based on a Q Energy investor pack and this was the map. Now, I guess the thing that was interesting after the fact, I just went and worked on it. You can see though, this is where it was proposed. This is the actual location based on uh, NOPSEMA, the Australian government website. And you can see there are actually a reasonable number of wells, um, Bamboo, One and Deep, uh, Glatton and Brigadier are all in this area. So it's not a complete wildcat in that respect. So what it did was using fault risk, we can take in any image and we can uh, georeference it and digitize the hang wall of all trade. Now it's, it's all about using a set of tools and this is my mate Nick's tool. This is what he uses to make his playgrounds. Um, his steel chainsaw and a nice bit of iron bark there. For us, it's the fault risk tool that I've written over the last 18 years with um, uh, Tony and Greg. Um, and that's really nicely described in the paper we put together in 2019. And also there's a YouTube video that describes the background to fault seal and how fault risk works. So if you want to dip into that, go and have a look. So what we've done is we've got the displacement profile for the east fault. Uh, and you can see I haven't, I haven't digitized all of it. I've just digitized to the spill point. So from the northern tip through to so we're deeper than the spill point because this bit doesn't actually affect the trap geometry as dictated um, and you can see it's got a really nice uh, displacement profile nice theoretical displacement profile and it's consistent throw so it's you know this is a good quality work what we did find though the heave was too wide these faults uh, even though they've got su substantial throw are drawn too wide so they had dips in the order of 30 or 40 degrees so the western fault is actually a compound structure um, digitizing 
um, from from this point through here through to here um, uh, we these fault element these were digitized but they weren't critical to the trap so from here to here you can see we've got actually two displacement maxima we've got a displacement maxima here and displacement maxima there so what we've done is we've split them into two genetic elements and so then in the trap analysis there's a, a west north and a west south in the trap analysis as you'll see in my video um, on how we use how to do fault seal analysis stratigraphy is just key uh, if you want to do a good fault seal analysis good maps but sequence stratigraphy go and get yourself a really good sequence stratigrapher and work out what's going on Go and have a look at the new paper that Bill Power and I have put together about the Brent province, uh, where we've gone and shown that a lot of the original shale gouge ratio work is actually, uh, we feel erroneous, and they're stratigraphic traps instead. So nonetheless, what we've done is we've taken ourselves the stratigraphy as presented by Q. This upper section is the critical element, and it's actually penetrated by the, um, the Brigadier well, which is on the same fault block, and this is the shallow Mungaroo. These were the trap elements or the, the sands that they were looking for deeper in the sequence. And I'm not sure what the basis of that was. We're simply working from what was in the um, investor pack. So just like Nick's nice furry, you know, iron bark logs, um, we've put together you know, a fairly furry and, and um, rough stratigraphy. We have though described these with uncertainty. So we sat through and, and put these in within the order of 100 meters uncertainty of thickness of the seal um, and the, of the thief zone. The critical element though is the, this thickness interplayed with the displacement on the fault. And as you can see, the faults are actually really good quality. I don't think there's anything too wrong with them. Good job. Um, and it f all comes down to this stratigraphy. Even though it's rough like Nick's logs, it's still good, good quality. So this is what we all want. We want a well forecast. This is a, you know, this is what a piece of iron bark looks like when it's turned into a, a um, piece of furniture. It's a beautiful, smooth, red wood, you know, just slightly stained, but you know, that's solid. And, and this is something that will last a lifetime. Um, and that's what we'd hope our well forecast to be. But the problem we've got is these large displacement faults cause the TR30 to juxtapose the main reservoir section. Assuming uh, that we have no membrane seal, and if you remember our 2019 work, we've really shown that it hasn't that we, we can't get membrane seal to work anywhere. And if you have a look at the fairly significant number of case studies we've put out there, we're not seeing membrane seal working. Um, so assuming that there's no membrane seal, we have moderate to low probabilities of getting very small columns. Um, you know, the TS, the upper sand, we've got an 80% chance of getting 62 meters, but with a 32 meter standard deviation column. 53% chance of the TR17 and a 14% chance, and a 50% chance for the TR14. Again, with skinny columns with large uncertainties on them. So we're at a crossroads. Do you take my pessimism on SGR, or do you sit there and think, well, you know, maybe being, you know, maybe being pessimistic is a good, th good thing. Um, this is the bushfires just near me. This is Starlight Trail, one of my favorite running trails. And you can see it happened to get torched by the flames. The flames were coming straight into that sign. It's burnt and you can see it came at an angle and it burnt the edge of this other uh, water catchment. You want to get, don't want to get burnt. The concern I've got with SGR is there's a chance you'll be like that Starlight sign. Oh, and by the way, there's another one of these amazing ironbarks. If we did use SGR, then we'd have a much higher chance of getting a significant column. We get 290 meters and 276 meters. That lower TR14 still has problems. It has, gets a higher chance of um, trapping a column, um, but it's still a less significant column. Uh, and that's effectively because the averaging uh, the, the SGR algorithm provides. But we've actually done a reasonable amount of work already in the Gorgon area. So we've looked at um, Drian, Orthrus, Maynard, uh, and a number of the other proprietary areas. So we've got about seven gas water contacts through there, and we've got better than 20 meter accuracy predicting those fluid contacts using juxtaposition. The shell gouge ratio in that uh, Mungaroo section didn't work. Uh, I know Gorgon's uh, 100 or so kilometers away, but it's a similar facies, same delta, 
um, we couldn't get SGR to work there. So, you know, cross, you know, you're crossroad, are you going to get burnt or not? And then I guess the other thing to consider with this is when you look at where the proposed location was, it was actually nearly 100 metres down dip uh, from the crest. These columns, you've got a really low chance of seeing any of these. It could have been a technical success at the crest. Um, it's actually this fault here that controls it. Um, but, you know, you, you'd be hard pressed at this 5700. Uh, that's 5700 there. You might have another 50 meters on top. So I don't think we'd actually be seeing these things. And this is why. The, here's the Allen maps. Um, this is the P10 Allen map. And what it is, is this TR30 unit dropping down over the main reservoir section. So purple is the footwall, Pur purple is the, is the upthrown side, light blue is the downthrown side, and you see that TR30 comes right the way down across the structure, getting ourselves a little bit of uh, accumulation here, and then bashing against the TR19 or TR17. And then TR14 has problems on both faults, but the eastern fault is what controls the, the, the 19 and 17. So you can see these red would be my, my little columns I could potentially get. So that's the P10 case, that's the P50 case, and you see everything changes a bit, and that's the P90. I'll go back, P90, P50, P10, P50, P90, P50, P10. So you're getting an idea about how these things are varying. This P10, P50, P90 are on juxtaposition area, it's not on any one of the fluid contacts, but it gives you an idea about how the variation is, is sitting in the whole system. Um, this is, these are three of 10,000 realizations for the Eastern Fault. So let's start to summarize it out. Um, Alexei Milkov over at um, Colorado School of Mines over at Golden in Colorado has done a fantastic job of data elicitation. I really like a huge amount of his work because he's, he's bringing common sense to how we address these things. And so he put together a really nice data elicitation project last year, asking a whole range of people how they, they perceive a set of prospects. Um, it's well worth getting a copy of the paper. Um, so in 2018, he had 80 people, and then 2019, he had 130 people look at a set of um, of prospects that were going to be drilled. And you can see that for uh, the iron bark, um, he had an 85% chance for, it, it was elicited. Now elicitation is asking a whole bunch of people who are experts, their response. Um, and so what we'll see there is to a certain extent a bias based on who the people are that follow Alexi. Um, and he is really well followed and he is really well regarded. Well, the well's actually dry and you know, the, the failure mode that was thought to be would be about reservoir deliverability. So people's perception was they drill down, it's a very deep well, and that because of the, deep, the, the, the depth of the well, there'd be significant reservoir degradation and there would, be, uh, there would be hydrocarbons, but they wouldn't be mobile, or they wouldn't be mobile at the rate that would be needed to make it economic. Um, so it'd be therefore cast as dry. And so this all came about reservoir deliverability. Since then, there's also been discussions because we don't know much about what actually has happened in the well. We just know that there are no hydrocarbons. And over time, this, this hopefully this video will be superseded and I can put an addendum to it. But just now we, we understand that the sands were penetrated, but there were no uh, hydrocarbon shows. Um, What's interesting with this, I don't think many of these people have drawn an Allen map or, or, or looked at the contours. Most normally we don't have that information. Alexi did put that information out in his, his package for people to have a look at, but nonetheless, I think the critical element that we've done here and why we called it dry in August uh, was the Allen map and generating the Allen map and the experience we've had of why SGR doesn't work. Here's my iron bark again, um, you know, and there are green shoots at the bottom of these. These trees are pretty amazing, and as you saw in the bush, they tend to, to survive a really bad fire event, and they'll, they'll sprout out from the base and often coppice and, and generate big multiple um, trunk trees. So, let, you know, let's hope that we get some good, good elements out of this. So, in summary, in 30, 35 minutes, we were able to go through and uh, make an assessment about this. The model was driven by displacement and the pre-drill stratigraphy. Um, 
There are other wells. We had access to the information. Mike Wilch here from Occam Technology. It has a fantastic set of well logs um, and Mike made them available after we did this work. But we sat and thought, well, no, let's, let's present this on what was available in the, in, the, in the open domain. And look, it would be really worth in a proper dry well analysis to go and get Mike's data and make sure that everything adds up, especially when the well data is finally released. So we predicted a dry well, charge is almost certain, the reservoir is, is very likely. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a deltaic system, but we know there are sands through there. Um, and Clio, for instance, there's a number of these fields where channel sands have been found. And so we really came down to, look, this would be a very small column um, and the failure would be due to lateral, failure would be due to lack of lateral seal. You know, without an hour map, you know, what would you predict? And I can see where Alexi's cohort have come through and said, well, you know, it should be fine. But as soon as you draw the Allen map, this becomes really obvious. That TR30 sand drops down uh, and it's an important one to, to put in there. Now, this could sound, uh, it isn't meant to, this isn't meant to sound negative. The, Q, the folks at Q are absolutely to be commended for actually putting the data out. It's very seldom that uh, prospector out there with enough information for somebody to do the calculation and I'd hate to think that by putting a video like this together and why I didn't publicize it at the time of the well was being, being drilled I'd hate to think that people didn't put data out because they were worried about the, re the, the response um, it's a good map uh, serendipity could have played into a whole range of things and, and Q and the joint venture partners would be commended for drilling the well uh, and for putting having the data out there and let's hope that in the future we get to see more of these data and so we can start to debate in a in a wider way the dry well analysis so i hope you enjoyed this uh this is my last of my iron barks this is the local crag um a few minutes drive from us here um uh, in the natai river system and again there's one of these great big iron bark trees sitting next to our beautiful Hawkesbury sandstone that makes up a lot of the a lot of the Sydney basin. So this is Craig Roberts, who's one of a um, uh, uh, one of the collaborators on the latest round of R and D we're going to be doing on fault systems in the Hawkesbury sandstone. So we're looking forward to Craig and his group of surveyors building some fantastic 3D models uh, in this sort of country full full of mine barks um, and trying to better understand the hydrogeology uh, of faults in the Hawkesbury sandstone. Hi folks, I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed my run come stagger in the bush. Um, I'm going back and cut the, the video together. Uh, over the coming weeks, we've got a whole bunch of um, case studies. We're also going to do a bit of masterclass or a don't BS the BS on Allen maps and triangle plots. Anyway, look out for those and we'll see you soon.